I choose to work where everyone can see how busy I am. I choose pedal power. I choose the freshest of beats. I choose to never burrito and drive. Whatever you choose, choose transit and do your part to spare the air. Did you know you can advertise on podcasts? Don't act like you're not impressed. Find out more at podvertise.com.au. That's podvertise with an s.com.au. Oscast. <laughs> Episode 7 of the Maker and the Drinker podcast. Can you believe we have got to seven episodes? John Retzis from First Drop Wines. Uh, this is Christmas week as well, so talk to us. It's Christmas Day and it's hot in South Australia normally. From First Drop, what are we going to have with our turkey? Uh, I wouldn't have a turkey to start with, but okay, if you sorry. do want to have a turkey... <laughs> <laughs> what are you having? Um, it's 40 degrees in Australia, so let's get some beautiful South Australian seafood, yeah. some prawns, um, some lobster, and uh, let's go fucking crazy. So that's the, F, that's the first F-bomb I've dropped. Yeah, to. congratulations. There's Thank plenty you. more to come. Yep. <laughs> um, so some beautiful South Australian white wine, you know, Sauvignon Blanc or Chardonnay from the hills, uh, maybe some Italian grape varieties like Anise or Pinot Grigio. Mm. Um, and then, um, you know, with main course, whether that's going to be, you know, some, you know, turkey or, or uh, maybe some barbecue, um, just, just something that's friendly for, for the weather and, yeah, just go maybe a little light-bodied Grenache um, and just, uh, yeah, wrap it up with something, um, maybe some, I don't know, a liqueur or some, just something on ice. Uh, okay, you're making fresh, me want to have a drink. Fresh fruit. Yeah. Far out. Um, we've, got, we've got great produce uh, in Australia and, um, you know, let's let's defend our industry, let's defend Australian wine and buy Australian um wine, um, you know, there's lots of wine that we can buy from elsewhere. Uh, but at the moment, I would uh, be buying great Australian produce and beautiful Australian wine because we've got some of the best wine in the world. Well, and support Australian podcasts. Thanks to Andy and Liam from Oscast Network for having us here for this podcast. As always, OzcastNetwork.com. Um, and we'll chuck all of the info about this podcast in the show notes. And if you like it, Press the like button. You can subscribe, give us a rating. Uh, However you get your podcast, this is available. So we will get into the episode. John, let's do it. This is another great story and it's kind of like mixed with uh, 2020 being a jerk and affecting this man's path but he's had some brilliant time to spend with his family. You can take it away. So my dear friend, uh, Misha Il- Il- Ilic, Ilic, Ilic uh, originally from, from Serbia via Italy. Well, Slovenia, Slovenia, Italy, Sweden, US. Yeah, and... Uh, and now in Australia. And now in Australia. So I met Misha years ago when he was uh, wine buying, I think it was the Italian club. The Italian club, yeah, um, Carrington Street. Carrington Street, uh, fine dining Italian restaurant. Uh, it used to be the uh, Enoteca Cucina on Carrington Street, which unfortunately uh, closed down. It was a beautiful restaurant on Carrington Street. It's, but, it's great, um, delicious food. Absolutely stunning. But let's go back to the beginning. Uh, you're in, you're in uh, Serbia. You look your mother in the eye and you said, Mum... I'm going to go to Slovenia. Is that right? Uh, no, went? actually, my family was already in Slovenia. Oh, okay. I was in the... Uh, I've done my homework. <laughs> John's yeah. hammered. <laughs> I, was, I was in the army. Yeah. I was in the army in the 90s during the war in the old Yugoslavia and uh, the push come to the shoal and, um, you know, because the army the army service was mandatory back in those days, so... Um, and right in the middle of all the conflicts and everything, uh, the decision was made that, you know, didn't want to be part of it, you know, what was happening in my old country. So I wanted to go and find a better life for myself. So, um, Oh, man, can you, sorry, can we stop down on that? Before we get to wine and stuff, that's full on. So there, there's, you don't get to say, it's conscription, is it? They just go, hey, you get to, you got to go to the, you got to serve in the military. Yeah, once, once you hit 18 and if you don't uh, continue your studies... Uh, if you haven't enrolled in your studies that year that you hit 18, you go in. Man, you know, we are so lucky in Australia. There's there's um, some of the Asian 
countries that um, some of the soccer teams have played against, like in the Asian Champions League, there are literally players that celebrate at the end of a game if they win and they go through to the next round or the next leg because that means they don't have to go serve in the military because they're going to be working and playing football. Like, it's, it's obviously different here. So if it's get into it straight away, how difficult is it to get out of it? Of the army? Yeah. Uh, very difficult. You You've got to do your time, don't you? It's you like, have to do your time. Is it so two got, years over there? You've got six, six months for the Army, you got a year for the um, Air Force and two years for the Navy. So it's a wow. luck, luck of the draw where you get selected to or what your um, skills are. Um, but, yeah, mandatory, six months of, uh, of Army service. National service during the communist yeah. regime, you know, just yeah. So during a pretty f- where, during a time where you're going to be actively just, serving, just the collapse of the communist, you know, because Yugoslavia started falling apart. So Slovenia gained independence then in '91, and then the rest started, you know, trickling down with the war in Croatia, Bosnia, and stuff like that. Oh man! Uh, so yeah, it wasn't a it was no brainer for me then to leave and uh, look for better life, you know, because there was uh, at that stage there was literally nothing back home. So how did you get to Adelaide then? If that's if you're looking for a better life, do you just spin a glow brown and go, oh, South Australia looks cool? Clarendon. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I was lucky enough to, uh, while I was working in Italy, to be approached by an agent uh, if I wanted to go to work in the US. And um, again, it was a no-brainer. The decision was automatic, yes. Um, when I left, um, still young, very young. So how old um, were you? This, this I was uh, just... 21, right. which was good so I could serve alcohol in the US. <laughs> <laughs> and drink it. Because otherwise you can't, you can't serve it and drink it, yeah. yeah right. uh, I remember it to a day, um, I left my old restaurant in Italy and uh, my old boss gave me $100 US dollars to buy myself a coffee when I get to New York. Where, and where in Italy were you working? Uh, you just up there? north, uh, across the border from Slovenia uh, in Trieste. Right. Um, there's a beautiful... Uh, a beautiful uh, place called Villa Andor. We used to work um, anything from protocol service to, you know, politicians, government, you know what I mean, all um, high-end um, clientele, which unfortunately now it's transformed into casino. The restaurant doesn't exist anymore, which is, a, you know, one of those things that um, fall through and, you know, people do different investments in. So from there, you know, like I said, I uh, got a decision, got a move and uh, went straight to Florida. And spent uh, close to close to six years in Florida, Miami or between Miami, Miami and Orlando. Yeah, right. Yeah. So you got to Florida. You had a hundred dollars US. You've had a coffee. Yeah, I had a coffee. How much was the coffee? <laughs> <laughs> it was a funny thing, you know what I mean? Because um, it was really hard because at that stage I was working as a chef, and when I left the, the restaurant in Italy, you know what I mean? My, you know, the the restaurant was owned by a really lovely family. And the old man, uh, he was kind of a sad, you know what I mean, and was really, you know, wasn't happy that I was leaving. So, um, yeah, I made a promise that one day I'll come back and I'll give him his own dollars back. Oh, wow. And, um, yeah, when I went back, he, he cried, you know what I mean, because I made a, I, I made that promise and I went back to him and, you know, said thank you for everything you've done for me. So he's, so. Like, in a way, he isn't, I guess it's a very extreme thing to say he saved your life, but he's actually helped set your life up. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, you know, went to US with a duffel bag with clothes that I had on myself plus uh, another pair of underwear, a T-shirt, pair of jeans, pair of shorts and a shirt and that was it. Oh, man. Without knowing anybody or without knowing where I was going, who I was meeting or what I'm going to do. I just knew I had a job in US. So that US job, what did it look like? Uh, the first job uh, fell through, unfortunately. Uh, it wasn't something that I really uh, appreciated or that I, did, that I didn't really like it. And um, then I got lucky to get tangled with Disney and went through Disney College in uh, in Florida. Um, Disney College? Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, what, what does that mean? How, and how do you uh, get tangled with Disney? <laughs> well, everybody that starts with Disney, they have to go through Disney College minimum of three to six months, you know, so they get to understand the um, the values and... Uh, Mickey Mouse. Uh, and everything started with Mickey Mouse, but it's more okay. uh, global than just Mickey Mouse. Uh, a lot of people don't realise what Disney owns 
the companies that they own. Yeah. It's just mind blowing. If I tell you that, you know what I mean? The ESPN was owned by Disney or anything like that, or uh, like uh, Firestone Tire Company, they're owned by Disney, or you know, Silver Horse Winery in California, it's owned by Disney. We just mm. go, what, what are you talking about? And they also have a significant cruise business as well. Is yeah, that, they, that, uh, did you end up on the on the boats? At yeah, some spent some time on the cruises as well with Disney and. Um, you know, after after the um, my six months of management courses at, at Disney, I moved from the back of house to front of house, um, and um, you know went through different um, different um, learning uh, exercises with them and finished their Plex, which is the preparing leaders for excellence, and the train the trainer exams and stuff like that. So. Uh, um, oh, like I said, I was young, didn't realize I hated it when I was there, but now I understand that um, they were, they pushed us because they wanted us to be successful. Were there many many people from other parts of the world? Because obviously, the you can hear the Serbian in you when you speak, and you look at, at, at Disney when you, uh, I guess, when you, if you're working on the the boats and stuff, and if you're front of house, were there many people from all parts of the world? Is that something that I wanted to showcase? Uh, there was hundred and. 145 different nationalities Wow! that we used to work together and as a young person then and at the age of today, I would recommend it to every single young person to go and do it. Wow. Yes, you, yes, you, work, yes, you work hard, but the, the friends that you, that you meet and you make for life all over the world is just priceless and the places you see around the world, it's priceless. Yeah. You will never get to uh, to experience that in your lifetime. Did you ever get any storms? Any yeah, we d- <laughs> well, my first one of my first um, uh, cruises with Disney in 1999, uh, we were um, uh, we got uh, we got we got <laughs> with uh, Hurricane Floyd. Hurricane Floyd was one of the biggest hurricanes at that stage, uh, bigger than Hurricane Ike, which hit Florida. Um, I think six years before, prior to that. And I just didn't know what to experience. You know what I mean? You're coming from a world that doesn't uh, doesn't have hurricanes. There's no hurricanes. And we were out on the sea and everybody's saying it was easier to be on the sea than on the land because once it hits the land, it's more, um, there's more devastation than if yeah, you're on the sea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a good thing is, you know, in those days, Disney had two cruise ships and they were... Um, Brand new, so Magic was released in '98 and Wonder was released in '99. So I was on Wonder, and Disney implemented this thing. Uh, well, they were one of the first cruise ships to put the um, the stabilizers, um, so the ship doesn't rock yeah. during the rough seas. But I can tell you, one of the restaurants, um, the first restaurant was on um, on a third level, deck three, and the waves were coming, splashing the windows on deck three, and wow. during Hurricane Floyd. It was that rough. The Russian holds uh, 468 seats. I think within 10 minutes, we maybe had 20 people in the dining room. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Okay. So you should be in Florida right now as we speak. We'll get to that um, a little bit later when we talk about COVID. And I guess we've spoken to a lot of people on this podcast about um, COVID and what we've learned from it. And I think... um, I don't want to break too much confidence, but speaking to you on the, the bus on the way back from JR's the other week, we had a really nice chat about COVID and the things that we've learned. So from the working from Disney, are you soon planning to come to Australia or is there a lot of stuff no, in between? No, if I, uh, uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff in between. Um, during my uh, time in Florida, um, the uh, Florida governor was uh, Jeb Bush, and uh, during my time in Florida, I was also with um, private butler company. And um, one day, uh, two gentlemen in black suits walk into the office, and uh, we already knew there was something important coming in because they all they put us in a room and they said these two gentlemen going to interview us. And um, I didn't have to tell much to these two gentlemen. Um, they knew basically everything about me. They knew everything about my family. Really? They knew everything, where I was from. The main thing they wanted to know because I was coming out of former Yugoslavia and because there was a war in my country back in the 90s, because my dad's Serbian, my mom's Bosnian. 
um, Bosnia was all of a sudden, you know, as a Muslim majority country. So they wanted to see if we were, if I was in any paramilitary units. To finish that, you know what I mean. Everything was fine, and then after two days, we were told that um, the former president George Harold Bush was coming with the entire family um, to Florida for holidays, and they were looking for people to look after them. And from 125 people, I got selected to look after them um, while they were in Florida, uh, together with my assistant Paula from Mexico. Um, so we went to Bahamas with them, we went to Caribbean with them, you know, everywhere they left from Florida, we used to go with them. And to, for me as a 20, 24 year old at that stage, you know, that was something that I will never forget for my, for the rest of my life, leaving, <clears throat> leaving Cape Canaveral in Florida, uh, on a luxurious yacht going to Bahamas and looking through the, one of the windows and watching the Coast Guard following us and submarines <laughs> and yeah. just to make so sure. So once you're a, a president of the US, you're always a president, basically. You've got the full mili- you've got the full security detail. I believe so, yeah. Um, I believe and so. And they still refer to you as president. Yeah. Um, we never did because that wasn't the part of, but, you know, you address him. What did you, uh, you, what did you call, call him, mate? Just, just M- Mr. George, Bush. George. <clears throat> Mr. Bush. You address him, you address him uh, as their titles. Yeah, well, right. this is a fair way from <clears throat> rocking up with a swag and a hundred bucks yeah. to then doing this. So, so well, private butler to George Bush Senior. George Bush Senior. Uh, so I met everybody. Good, was he a good bloke? Uh, I, listen, uh, I left my country because of politics, and I don't care for politics. But as a family, they're one of the nicest families that are that I ever looked after. Um, I, I, I met everybody except George W. because George W. was president at that time. But I met his wife, I met his daughters, Jenna and Barbara, I met his, uh, you know, Jeb's, Jeb's family and uh, George Harold, Sen- George Sr., uh, his wife, Barbara. And I remember on my last contract, um, my last contract, uh, when, I, uh, when I told them that I was leaving, um, Barbara started to cry and, you know, I said, um, I said, there's no need for that, I'm just a servant in your life, ma'am. And she turned towards me and told me, um, um, don't ever say to anybody that you are their servant because you're more, much more than that. Um, on my final trip, he, uh, George um, Harold insisted to take a photo. The security, the Secret Service, they didn't allow it. And he said, well, I'm making still decisions. So me and Paula... Uh, we were blessed with them um, that we could take photos with them. And it was in the last week of my contract, you know what I mean? They called me in the office and said, there's a mail for you. And I was thinking to myself, well, who would send a mail to me in the US? And I opened the envelopes and there was um, all the photos that um, that they took and one of them was signed, uh, you know, with the wording of, um, with many, many thanks, Misha, from J.H. Bush, and uh, within a, within that envelope, there was um, presidential seal and a key that he um, honored us, honored to me and Paula as a gift. Wow. And that's something that it's priceless. The, a, a physical key? Yeah, there's a key and a presidential seal as a president of the United States. Yeah. So, uh, so it's like a little, um, what I can say, Copper or um, does it open anything? No, but it's it's. It um, might open I, something. I might well, open a safe yeah. to like billions of dollars. Start uh, with a hundred, end up a billionaire. I've never been a materialistic person. Mm. You know what I mean? And um, I'm very, you know, easygoing and you know. It's a great story. Appreciative There's of not everything. Not too many people that would have um, served the President of the United States yeah. and, and and be held in that high regard. We can see the, the, how proudly you talk about it though because I think you speaking about um, Disney or getting to America, Disney and then this, it's like the values that you've learned yeah. along the way has brought you to where you are now and I think that they, I don't think they'd be taking photos with everybody and the fact that they can take the time to go, um, you need to, you know, be true to yourself. It means you've 
and uh, maybe that's why he speaks so passionately about about Disney, about how, how they've helped shape you. Just imagine yourself, a young kid with nothing coming out of Eastern Europe and seeing the world. When I first came to US, I, just, I was just lost. I didn't know a cereal until I came to US. And they asked me, would you like cereal for breakfast? And I'm looking, what is cereal? Yeah, right. We used to eat polenta and, and milk for breakfast. <laughs> Far out, man. Yeah, it's a different world. I mean, uh, you know, Europe in those days and obviously yeah. military conflict would have been yeah. a totally different world. So you've, you've, you've got your seal from the president, you've... You've resigned from the butler uh, service, and then, yeah. and then what do we do next? Well, that was a trip to you. There was a trip to to Australia. I met my wife in ninety uh, nine. She was in US as um, as a tourist. We met, started chatting, uh, you know, and then in two thousand she moved to US with me. Uh, lived in Florida with me until um, January two thousand and four, uh, and yeah, January two thousand and four we moved to Australia. So your wife's from my wife's from Adelaide. She's an Australian, Australia. yeah, Australian born bred. Her family's all Australian. Um, so yeah, it was a no brainer. Yeah, right. Uh, it was hard to get used to it uh, first within Australia. I wanted to go back to US within the first six months, and you know, what was the what didn't you get you um, around the flies? No doubt. No, the the Adelaide, um, the Adelaide. It's a beautiful city, and I love living in Adelaide now. Coming, coming from US and, you know what I mean, the work that I used to do, I struggled finding something very similar here in, in Adelaide. And um, one of my first jobs that I got actually through, <laughs> funny enough how this happened, um, was actually through Dorinda Hafner. Yeah. Dorinda got me a job at Hilton at Grange when Jean-Luc was uh, GM still. And Jean, Jean-Luc loved me just because, you know, all these, you know, things that I've done with Disney and, you know, with, with the presidential family. But unfortunately, that didn't last long because Jean-Luc got transferred to another, to, um, to another, I think he went back to Europe and nothing was the same again. So it didn't last long at Grange. So um, trip from there was going to the Blanc uh, when the Blanc was on Hutt Street. Uh, we won the best seafood restaurant in South Australia and then we won the best seafood restaurant in, in, in Australia. And then I got poached by someone else, by an accountant, to go um, to the Italian club. Okay, so we're, we haven't spoken about wine yet. So, no. And you're an expert in that field. So <laughs> how... When does that begin? Because you've had an amazing back... Mate, I, I sold shoes for a couple of years and worked in radio and here I am, unemployed. So my backstory is really boring. Yours is outstanding. Can you... <laughs> well, I didn't, I didn't really start focusing too much on wine until I got to the Italian club. Um, at the Italian club, I, um, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't get used to Australian wine first because it was very different than European, big and juicy and bold and high alcohol. Even in US, you know what I mean, everything was, you know, you're looking on some of the American wines that weren't as big as, as Australian wine. So when I came to Australia, I was drinking only white. I never drank red in Australia. Um, that was your first hangover after Australian wine. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very, very good question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, was, it wasn't until... Um, Italian club, Italian club. Um, that's when I started really thinking about wine and learning and reading. But when you, you, I come from a chefing background. You know, I never, never drank wine in my life. We, my mum and dad had vineyards at home, and I hated it because when everybody else went to the beach, you know what I mean. I had to work in vineyards, so it wasn't until you know that I really had to start to focus when I got to Italian club uh, when I took over uh, as a restaurant manager of the Enoteca. And then I had to learn. So, it was, so you stopped. You stopped cooking then. Ah, uh, no, I stopped cooking when I was in US. That's okay. when I moved from the back of a house to front of a house. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Anoteca was basically for me. I had to learn because there was no one else there to to do the wines and and um, sell the wines because the previous previous sommelier that was there they opened their own restaurant, uh, Asadjo and King William at that stage. So. Yeah, so you have to have to learn a lot, and you you know this as well, Jay. Like you, you almost go. You have to educate yourself 
but then learn how to communicate that to other people in not necessarily the same way you've educated yourself. Like if someone comes to Home of the Brave and like, tell us about the wine, you kind of need to know the person you're speaking to so it cuts through to them, right? Really? (laughs) <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, you do absolutely. It's and you need to you need to uh, communicate um, in in layman's terms, if you like, uh, in yeah. plain speak, um, because you know not many consumers uh, understand the the technical side of things. So, um, I remember meeting Michelle at the LA Club uh, fine dining Italian restaurant, and he curated a beautiful wine list. It was uh, it was sort of. In those days, one of the iconic wine lists of, of Adelaide. I mean, we've had some great restaurants in the past at the Hilton, obviously with Chong Lu at the mm. Grange and, um, you know, before that, Lee Tu Tai and uh, um, some amazing restaurants, Alan Weiss's Magic Flute, Nick uh, Papazakariakis's uh, Chloe's Restaurant. Can you say that surname again? Papa Zakariakis. Far out. It's very good. Um, he rolls you know, off. Jama. You know, Jama's easier to Peter say. Jama. <laughs> I'll say Jama very quietly, very <laughs> softly. Um, so we've had some great restaurants. So, you know, Luca Threptus, you know, took before your time potentially at Mezzer. So we've had some iconic restaurants in South Australia. And in the day, South Australia, I mean, people would leave Sydney or, you know, fly from Sydney or Melbourne to come and eat in Adelaide. Yeah. Um, and look, we've got some great restaurants uh, now, of course, but uh, in those days it was pretty iconic. And, and Michelle's were on the were on the cusp of that uh, at the Adelaide Club, and it was great. You created a great wine list, and I guess the most sought after F and B job or one of in in the town is uh, is the Adelaide Club, which is I guess your next appointment, if I'm not mistaken. Is that That's correct. Yeah. yeah. So uh, how many years there? He, I was there 14 years. But it was a funny story. A year before I, I would move to the Adelaide Club from the Italian club, three gentlemen walked in to an Oteca for lunch. Is this a joke? No, <laughs> not really. No, this was a true story. And um, at that stage I was already, you know what I mean, I was, you know, I've, I was done with the Italian club and, you know. Um, so these three gentlemen, they were really impressed with my service, my wine knowledge and everything and, you know, what wines I had on the list because they said there's wines that, you know, they haven't expected to be here, let alone in Australia, but on on, on a list at, uh, you know, one of the restaurants. And at the end of lunch, one of them gave me their business card and said, if you ever get fed up with this job, please give us a call. And you always think, yeah, you know what I mean, another one of, you know, yeah. drunken customers, you know what I mean, offering everything and anything, you know what I mean. But I kept this card. It was actually a year, year after that that I decided to leave Italian club and I told my wife that I'm going back to US no matter what. And she said, there is no way in hell we came home to have family. You are staying here. You need to find something. And Abdullah used to run Pranzo. So oh. I went to Abdullah and I said, mate, whatever you have, I didn't work for a month and a half. My wife's on my back. What do you, you got anything? And he said, I can give you only a waiter. I can't give you a restaurant manager. And I said, that's fine, whatever. In the meantime, I, my wife was pushing me to call this fella. I kept this business card for a year in in my wallet and it was almost faded. So I gave him a call and they said, oh, that's brilliant. We're looking for a wine manager at the Adelaide Club. And I'm just like, pardon my ignorance, but what is the Adelaide Club? And, you know, he explained it to me and looking, um, when I was coming for an interview, there's this building, but there's no numbers. So, you know, I didn't know what was coming through. Um, Just a green door. (laughs) Green door. Green door, no terrace. I walked in, had an interview, uh, a lot of argument on the interview. Oh, shit. Um, what are we, no, no, we arguing? Uh, I was, I was um, interviewed by a committee, by a chairman, by, oh. you know, by a GM at that time. Uh, GM was um, straightforward. No, we can't afford him. Chairman said, Steve, you know, is, oh, we okay. need him. Um, unfortunately, Adelaide Club was going through some um, challenges at that time. Um, I left the interview, didn't hear from them for a couple of weeks. I was about to start work with Abdullah on Monday. I get a call on Saturday and the guy goes, you starting next week. And I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> so that was the end of the story after 14 years at the Adelaide club. So the Adelaide club is a private club. Uh, and in those days there was no uh, women allowed. Is that right? Is it still the case today? Uh, there's no women as members. Right. Uh, the women are allowed to come in uh, in a, as a companions to the male members, uh, but no female members as such. 
the only female, um, not even a, a, a proper member, was uh, Marjorie Jackson. What is more secretive, working for the Bush family or working at the Adelaide Club? I would say both have their own um, significant thing that, um, I mean, I wouldn't talk about certain things about either of them. Yes. Uh, so just because of the respect that I have, uh, you know, that I have for, for the Bush family, unfortunately now both of them have passed away, Barbara and George. Um, but I have, uh, I still have very high respects towards the club and the members. So there were certain things that I wouldn't want to talk about. I kind of like not knowing anything. I kind of like the alluring thing going, there's this cool club in Adelaide where you're a part of and then... Um, it's not the secrecy of it. It's for the privacy of the members. Yes. More it's an than, exclusive... More uh, than secrecy. Uh, yes, as yes, well, yeah. It? It's probably the most exclusive offering in terms of food and beverage in, in South Australia. In that well, you, we would like to think so. You need to be a member. You need to be invited. Yeah. To become a member. When you say exclusive for food, so the food is top notch. Is this the closest as, as Adelaide would have to uh, Michelin? The food's excellent, of course, but I think um, it's an exclusive membership. Like you can't just yeah. front up and say, look, I'd like to buy a membership. Yes. Um, you, Doesn't I work think, that way. I think you need to be uh, nominated by a certain amount of members mm. um, and then you need to be approved. Is this, so are there some wines I, there? You and I may, may never be nominated. No, no Jared. chance, mate. I can't even get into the bloody Semaphore Golf Club. Don't even worry about that. <laughs> are there some wines there that are only available there and you can't get them anywhere else in South Australia? Uh, yeah, I had numerous wines like that. Really? That people would just... I actually had winemakers. I've done a, I've done a Piemont wine lunch with three winemakers from Piemont. And Nicola Alberto, when he came to, when he came to the cellar, when I took him down to the to the cellar, and he he just shook his head. He said, "I cannot believe that you have Luigi Giordano Barolo in your cellar from 1980s." He said, "This it's hard to find in Italy, and you have it in your cellar, or or, or uh, Borgogno Barbaresco from 1969." He just couldn't believe it, and he's born in Piemont, he's mm. raised in Piemont, he is making wine in Piemont, and he was just blown blown away. With stuff like that. Yeah, you did create uh, an amazing wine offering, an amazing cellar. Um, so is that your job to source the wines then? Uh, well, I took, I, when I first came in, uh, I took as a wine manager and then within two years I um, approached the committee because the, the wine was somewhere where we wanted to be and the food was always lacking. So I approached the committee and uh, I asked them if there's if they could take it in consideration that um, I would take a job as a food and beverage manager. So then I would take food as well to the next level because we just couldn't offer the wines of that caliber when food wasn't really matching. And they, they agreed. And then within a within few years, we completely changed the, the menu, the offering, the, um, the, the quality, the standard of food, the, 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 you know what I mean? There was things that, People never even think of it that we would serve in the Adelaide Club and we used to bring in, you know, direct from Italy like uh, white truffles or we would get Toro Tuna straight from Port Lincoln flown in, you know, the same day and pick it up at the airport. Um, you know what I mean? Anything and everything, you know what I mean, that, that they wanted, of course, at a certain price, we would bring it in. Mm. We started doing all these lavish dinners, you know what I mean, uh, for up to $1,000, $2,000 per person. Um, which never happened in the club before. And all of a sudden, you know what I mean, we could create things like that because we were uh, really focusing on um, delivering the best to our abilities. Because at the end of the day, that's their home away from home, but it's also the place where they, where they as members can showcase mm. to their guests what we could do. Can you recall, um, if you can say it, the most expensive bottle of wine you've poured a glass of? Yeah, I can. It was actually uh, a magnum of uh, 2002 Domaine de la Romane Conti Echezo. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. Not bad. What's, um, what, what's that worth? We, I mean, our prices are very different than the rest of the world. So we had it at $185 a glass, 100 mil. Cheap. That's cheap. Jeepers. Or a 75 mil of uh, 1980 Chateau du Cam. Which at is ninety five dollars. Oh, good value there, there, mate. Before we um, before we uh, 
wrap up, I want to find out what hap- was supposed to happen to you. However, something we haven't done on the podcast before, because I love, we all love JR, right? He's a friend of ours and we can always talk about um, how much we love his wine from a friend point of view. But for someone who is an expert in wines now, what do you love about First Drop? Oh, everything. I love the, you know, first and foremost, it's the wines. When I met JR, he was uh, actually at... Um, <laughs> quite, a, quite a long time ago at the Italian club and then we bond this friendship that uh, I think, you know what I mean, was mutual because we both love food and both love wine. And um, for me, you know what I mean, it's a combination of everything that the first drop can offer. It's the, it's the quality against the quantity, uh, the, the quantity of the mass production. And also they're focusing on, on varieties that uh, a lot of people are forgetting about it. And at the beginning of the podcast, John, John mentioned that, you know, buy Australian, buy Australian, you know what I mean, and Sauvignon Blanc. And, but I wouldn't go anywhere else. It's an endless summer. Let's hope that it is. Let's stick to the endless summer. And, and this is not a plug for, for first drop wines. But the endless summer Pinot Grigio could match the variety of seafood, South Australian seafood that we could offer this year for Christmas. So... There's, you know, the the humor, uh, you know what I mean? The the labels, the 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 the, the expression of the terroirs yeah. where the wine's coming from, it's all coming to play. You know what I mean? When you're looking for a really good bottle of wine, don't judge the wine by the label. I always said to anybody, you know what I mean, that I sell the wine to, even my old members at the club, don't ever judge it by the label. You know, uh, judge it by what's inside the bottle. Mm. Now. You're supposed to be in America right now speaking to us because of, of COVID. So yes. you're supposed to be going back to uh, to Orlando to work in a pretty good job. Yeah. Um, I resigned from the club with a year's notice. I gave him a year notice because I wanted to be fair. club's been fair towards me for 14 years, so I wanted to be fair towards them. I wanted to make sure that I had enough time for to find a replacement for myself. At the same time, um, I got an offer to return back to U.S., to take over as the uh, maitre d'hôtel at uh, Remy, at the two Michelin star restaurant. And that's supposed to happen this year in May. Um, as we all know, COVID came. A, um, uh, I'm resigned from the club. Uh, can't go to US. There's nothing in Australia. We're in lockdown. What the hell am I going to do? So I had to really start thinking quickly. And um, my new venture, Vino with Misha, is born. We're offering um, wine service to mailing, li- to mailing list customers only. We offer um, some, um, um, we, we continue doing some educational events with uh, like wine events or, or whiskey masterclasses, cigar and whiskey masterclasses. A um, few um, wine list um, um, developments with different restaurants in Adelaide and uh, just trying to get myself busy and um, Make sure that I can um, support my family. Well, speaking of your family, we both we've both agreed uh, in earlier episodes that it's given us time to step back. Although really awkward, how um, awkward it has been with COVID. But step back, reassess, look at what the constants are in life. And you were talking about how much uh, the quality time with your family has been incredible. It's the one thing that um, that I learned due to COVID. It's what's important in life, and that's my family and friends. And um, what I miss for the last 14 years that I've been in the club, I am gladly taken on now with both hands and spending time with my, my kids, uh, with all three of them, uh, taking them in and out of schools and to all different activities and sports and stuff like that um, and literally enjoying it. He's a great man, isn't he, John? It's a fascinating story and it's uh, I've known Misha um, since well, maybe 2005 when you Started there was six at uh, Endoteca at uh, the Italian club, um, but it's you know you meet these people through wine and through work or life, and you just connect with them straight away. And I just felt that connection immediately. Um, and since then, uh, just an amazing amount of respect for the work he's done um, at the Adelaide Club. One of the most respected people at the club. Um, and I just hope that uh, you don't leave us. I hope you stay here, and uh, whilst the Remy job will be amazing, I'm sure, um, it's uh, he's one of the great people of hospitality and, and food and wine in, in, in Australia, so 
it's a it's an honour to have you here, Misha, and it's an honour to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Mutual mutual respect. Mutual respect. Hey, how do we get in touch with you if we want to learn more about your business? Have you got a website or yep, anything? Yeah, Misha dot com. Uh, websites there or um, Vina with Misha Instagram. Vina how do we Misha. spell your first name for the people who are illiterate? M I C H A. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Jared, for inviting me. Oh, 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 o